Um, let's pray together before we open God's Word. God, we, uh, we enjoy worshiping you together, even laughing together. We come now to your Word and we ask you to speak to us through it. We open our hearts and our minds to it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As goofy as that video uh, was, we, you know, we have fun writing the script for those, but somehow they never quite, I don't think our gifter is acting, but uh, we, we, um, we do face opposition. We do face struggles in our own personal lives and the life of our church and our summer-long series on the book of Nehemiah. It's an ancient text which tells a very remarkable story in the history of Israel, but it's incredibly relevant to us. At least I felt that way in the study of it and the preaching of it. We've seen over and over again how this ancient story has a lot to say to our current cultural context and to our own lives today. We've seen throughout, you could really trace out the story of Nehemiah. And by the way, if you haven't been with us, Nehemiah, together with the book of Ezra, make up one book in the Jewish Old Testament. And they really tell one story about how God brought his people back from captivity. Babylon conquered Jerusalem, took thousands of Jews captive, and they were gone. Jerusalem was essentially destroyed, except for a small remnant, for a hundred years. Nehemiah and Ezra tell the story about how God brought his people back in successive waves and restored them to their land and to their status in the, in the world. And we would not know is Judaism as we know it today if it were not for these men in this time in this story. And if you look at Nehemiah, you can trace it out that God, as he used him, Nehemiah faced significant challenges in almost every chapter that we've been looking at so far. In chapter one, he faces the personal conviction challenge of hearing the, 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 the sorry state of God's people. His heart is broken, he weeps, he fasts, he prays for days. In chapter 2 is the challenge of standing in front of the greatest, most powerful man in the, on earth, the king of Persia, and at, making bold requests to go back and seeing God answer that prayer. In chapter 3, it's, it's the challenge of how to organize this massive, monumental, overwhelming task. Pastor Bruce preached to us about how Nehemiah organized them by clans and by families in sections of the wall. It's a remarkable story how even perfume makers were given a role in building the wall. And in chapter 4 last week, we saw that, that he faced the challenge of opposition from the outside, serious threat of attack from those that did not want God's people or God's plan to succeed. And now we come to chapter 5, and the challenges are not yet over. In fact, I don't think it's a stretch to say what we're going to read about and look at tonight is the most significant challenge Nehemiah and the people of God have faced so far in the story. If you have your Bible, you can open with me to Nehemiah 5 or follow along on the screens. We'll read the first five verses of Nehemiah chapter 5. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said... With our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other, man, other men have our fields and our vineyards. Let's talk about what's going on here, a little historical background. As you know, we, last week we talked about a guy named Sanballat the, the Ammonite, and Tob Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and the people outside of the region of Jerusalem that were opposing them. They uh, jeered at them, they mocked God's people, and they made a serious m military threats uh, of invasion. But through all that, the work on the wall continued. And the people on the outside saw they weren't able to stop them. They weren't able to, to stop, uh, to oppose and bring to a halt the building of the wall. So like people, nations do today, these countries got together and put kind of a, a trade embargo. The cities around Jerusalem decided we'll no longer uh, conduct any trade with the people living in and around Jerusalem. Those working on the temple, as we saw at the end of chapter 4, couldn't leave their posts from the threat of invasion. They had to stay there day and night. They traded off holding the weapons and doing the work. And they weren't able to go anywhere else, namely back to their own homes and their lands. Most of these people were not trades builders by trade. They were farmers, a lot of them. And they left their fields and their crops, and their livestock un untended, unattended too, excuse me. And add to this fact that there's a famine in the land. It's a rough year agriculturally. There's a famine in the land. And add to this that the king's tax was high and still had to be paid. So it's not a good economic year. Taxes are too high. People are unable to attend to their own businesses because of the work they're doing for God. This is a tough, 
All this makes for some very lean times for God's people and some very poor people among the Jews. But the worst part of all is not these factors. It's not the economy. It's not the tax rate. It's not the famine. The worst part of all is how these Jews, God's chosen people, respond to it. How they treat each other in the midst of it. That's the shocking and I think really tragic part of it altogether. The real danger is not the, the, the taxes or the famine. It's what happens inside the walls, inside of God's people. Look at verse 1 again if you have your Bible. It's not on the screen. Verse 1. There arose a great outcry of the people and their wives and against their Jewish brothers. That word against sort of sets the tone for the whole chapter. There was an outcry among the Jews against their brothers, their, their family members, their fellow Jews. I think the greatest obstacle for God's people then and now is often the struggle within. It's not on the outside. We get focused on the outside, who opposes the church, who opposes God's word. And those, there certainly is opposition in our culture. But often I think the greatest challenge for the church and for God's people then is the struggle inside, in our own hearts and interpersonally within the church. We see four groups of people here in this part of the text. Uh, four, in these first five verses, sort of four groups that are outlined. The first one, those who owned no land and were starving. The very first group. Those, for there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. Let us get grain. We have no way to get food. We are starving quite literally and no way to get it. No land to sell, no, no way to borrow. We're in real serious trouble. There were those who owned land and uh, were mortgaging their land to pay for food. The only way they had was to mortgage their own property to their fellow Jews to borrow against their land to get food. And then there were those who um, had to borrow money to pay the tax so this is a hierarchy, the, the absolutely starving poor, those who had to give up their, their inheritance, their land to get money, get, get food, and those who just couldn't pay the taxes. These three groups, the fourth group then, are those who were exploiting the first three. Those who had enough resources and means to take advantage of the first three groups. All of this, remember, happening inside of God's people. Charging huge amounts of interest on loans to their fellow Jews. That's bad enough. Not only that, but taking their property, even their children, as collateral against the loan for those who couldn't pay. It's shocking behavior, really. When I first read it, I thought, how could they do this to each other? I mean, I'm not saying God's people then and now aren't above mistreating each other. We know that. But how could they do this? How could they take each other's children as collateral against a loan and put them in servitude? But what they were doing, this is important, what they were doing was totally culturally acceptable. What they were doing was not at all outside the accepted norm in the ancient world. This was a common practice. It, was, it would not have been thought of by anybody else as inappropriate or outside the bounds of the social norms. But God's people are not to operate just within the bounds of cultural or social norms. We're supposed to be different culturally in every way. You know, it's not insignificant that this conflict happens up over money. I have a good friend in our church who's a financial consultant, and he tells me, has told me the story. He said, Peep, money makes people crazy. He once told me the story about a Christian family that he was helping uh, deal with their large inheritance from their parents. He said it was one of the saddest things he ever witnessed in his 20 years in the industry. He said they tore each other apart over their parents' inheritance. Those who claimed to be Christ followers. He said it was ugly and it was awful and it was sad. Money makes people inside and outside of the church a little crazy. Now, I think we tend to fool ourselves uh, in our culture into thinking that what I do with my money is somehow separate from how I, my own faith or my spiritual life. We could not be farther from the truth if that's what you believe. Nothing reveals the depth of your heart, your true spiritual life, like how you think about and handle and use your money, how generous you are, and so forth. So instead of taking care of each other, at the worst time, right, this famine and the high tax and tough situation comes at a, a very hard time for God's people. When they're still vulnerable, the work's not quite yet done. Instead of rallying together, they fight. They take advantage. They exploit each other. Remember when Hurricane Katrina hit? I don't know, how many years ago was that now? Seems like a long time ago. I can't remember. 
eight, year, eight or nine years ago, it was devastating. And we saw, if you watched on television, I remember going down to Gulfport, Mississippi with Noah, my oldest son, on a father-son trip a couple of years after that to help restore and repair. But when you watched on TV in the, in the, in the immediate wake of that, tra- that natural disaster, that catastrophe, you saw two extremes. We saw people sacrificing a lot, driving across country, giving up a tremendous amount to serve people in dire straits. We also saw people from that, that very community looting, robbing, taking advantage of others' misfortune for their own gain. The same thing happens here. I think tough times bring out the best and the worst in all people, even in God's people. And I don't think it's a stretch to say this is the most serious threat to the people of God so far. If you've been studying with us, you know, nothing, it's, it, think about this, nothing has stopped the work on the wall. Since Nehemiah arrived there and the work began, nothing has stopped it. Not the taunts of Sambalot and Tobiah, not the threat of invasion. They, they have worked with sword on one side and shovel in the other. They've been right along working with all the threats. In fact, I think you could say the opposition actually served to rally God's people together, strengthened them. The external opposition made them stronger, bond together, trust God more. But for the first time, the work stops. You know, in chapter 5, there's not one reference to the continuing work on the wall. The real threat is it within. The real threat to what God wants to do in his people comes in how they treat each other. And you know, it's the same thing today in the church. Our real opposition, it's not out there, it's in here. It was the true then and it's true now. This is the most serious threat yet that they faced yet. So how does Nehemiah respond? Let's look at the next few verses, verses 6 through 13, for how Nehemiah responds to this very serious threat. Verse 6, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them. And I said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. And they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. It's a pretty remarkable story here, what Nehemiah does. His first response is what? What's his immediate reaction? Anger. He's angry. He's hot, and he should be. It was my, when I read the story, selling children, anger at this. But verse 7 tells us something about the wisdom of Nehemiah. He was passionate enough to get angry. In verse 7, but I took counsel with myself. He was wise enough not to react in anger. Those two verses, I was very angry, but I took counsel within myself. That's a short little snapshot, I think, of the wisdom of this man. I was hot. I was ticked off at the way God's people were treating each other, and rightfully so. But I was wise enough to stop, to pause, to sit with it, to pray, to wait, to listen to God before I responded. First of all, his anger is there's a total disregard uh, for um, God's word. Exodus 22, verse 25, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor. You are not to charge interest among your brothers. That's exactly what they're doing. Total disobedience to God's word. Less than a decade earlier, Ezra had come back and brought back the law and preached the law to the people. They knew what God's law said, yet they disregarded it when it was to their gain. Has that ever happened in the culture today? People who claim to be Christ followers saying, well, I'll just wall off that part. I'll disregard that part of God's word because (laughs) it's in my interest, my financial interest, not to pay attention to that right now. He was also angry because work on the wall stopped. That was his priority, to complete the wall because that would give the people security and identity. 
And for the first time, it ground to a halt, not because of those outside, but because of those inside. I think sometimes we're our own worst enemy in the church. It must have been terribly frustrating for Nehemiah to think, how can we stand so strong when there's an army organized against us and yet fail so miserably internally like this? Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, not on the screens, but I'll read it for you. It's pretty profound. It speaks right to this passage. It says, For it is not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. This is describing the bitterness of betrayal, right? Be one thing if those outside of God's family acted this way, you kind of almost expect it. But this is internal. This is those that are supposed to be brothers to each other, sisters to each other, family members acting this way. Must have been devastating, I think, to Nehemiah. I would imagine, and I'm imagining now, that when he was praying about what he was going to do, standing before the king, and on his three-month journey to Jerusalem to begin this project, he knew there was going to be an external opposition. He expected it. That's why he asked for letters for permission. That's why he had a military escort. I, this may have caught him off guard a bit. The peop, God's own people, after all we've been through, acting this way? He makes really four appeals here. In fact, back to verse 7 for a moment. He was passionate enough to get angry, but wise enough not to react. I took counsel within myself. Uh, the Hebrew actually reads something like, I listened to my own soul. Proverbs 16, 32, better a patient man than a warrior. Better one who rules his own spirit than one who conquers the city. So Nehemiah then, after this, makes four appeals to God's people. The first one is the love of God's family. The love of God's, he appeals to the love of God's family. Listen, notice what he says in verses 7 through 10. He says, I took counsel with myself. You are exactly interest, each from his own brother. And then in verse 8, we have bought back our Jewish brothers. And then in verse 9, walk in the fear of God and, 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 and love of your brother. Four times in these three verses, Nehemiah uses the word brother. Now, don't be thrown off by the male. It, it could mean sister as well. He's saying he's using family language among the people. Why? He's saying, this is not how you treat family. This is not how you behave in God's family. You know, if you want to know somebody, you, could, you can get to know them at one level when you see them out in public, right, or at a dinner party or at a, at a, at a gathering or even in church. But when you go to their home, spend time and see them interact with their husband, with their wife, with their children, you get a different glimpse, don't you, about what their heart is really like, what kind of a man or woman they really are. Nehemiah is saying, this is not how you act in God's family. It shouldn't be this way. Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. That's not happening right now among God's people in Jerusalem. I remember years ago when I took a trip, I think it was 2000. It might have, no, I don't remember. Yes, it was before 9-11, it was 2000. I went to Russia, to Samara, Russia, with a group from our church to our sis, then sister church in this, in this region of Russia to help them celebrate their centennial, 100 years. They'd outlived communism. And they were celebrating this. And we, I went as a delegation just to encourage them, be with them. And the pastor of this church, a guy named Victor, just a wonderful godly man. I observed him the way he was with his own family and children, the way he was with the people in his church. And about the second or third night there, we, we went, we'd been preaching in different services all day uh, and different churches all day long, went to their, some of their church plants, and I was exhausted. I still had jet lag. I've been preaching through an interpreter, so you, it's like twice as long, right, because they have to wait for the interpretation. And I was just done. We went to the home of one of these young pastors. We crammed into this little living room, sat around. One of the men played on this little tiny, like little mini piano and sang hymns in Russian. I just kind of made sounds with my mouth, you know. I didn't recognize them. And I was kind of falling asleep. And then Victor got up and started to cry as he prayed. And he called me. He said, Jeff is a good brother. A good brother, he said in English. He called me a good brother. I've never forgotten that. He hardly knew me. Just got there. Never met him. Never been there before or since. Because of the love we shared for Christ and for his church, he called me a good brother. Nehemiah, I think his heart is broken. Comes out in anger because he sees this is not how brothers and sisters treat each other. 
Now look around the room for a moment. I mean, actually do that. I have asked this before. Actually look around, make, make awkward eye contact with somebody you kind of sort of know because the pastor told you to. You know who you're looking at? Your brother, your sister. Those people that are sitting around you, if they love Jesus, they're your brothers. They are sisters. Not your weird aunts and uncles, not your strange cousins who you don't associate with. They are to be your brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples if what? If you tell them all about it? If you go to church every Sunday? If you memorize the Bible? If you love each other? The way that you love each other has as much to do with God's mission in the world as anything else, maybe more. Nehemiah knew that, and that's why he's, I think he reacts this way. So he appeals to the love of God's family. How many times have people been turned off by God, on God or even rejected Christ because of the way they see Christians treating each other? And loving each other, by the way, is not being polite when you come to church once a week. That's not loving each other, that's being socially nice. Loving each other is not just, you know, not being rude. Loving each other is sacrificing for another person's good. Laying down your own needs and desires and rights to serve another. That's loving someone. That's how the church is supposed to behave. The second appeal. He reminds them of God's purpose, a reminder of God's purpose. Let me read verses 8 and 9 again. And I said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? What's he saying here? The word bought back is the Hebrew word kana. It means, it literally is the same word translated redeemed in many other places in the Old Testament. It means to purchase out of, purchase back. Literally, buy back is the word redeemed. Same Hebrew word. Nehemiah says we, meaning he and his closest followers and family members, have been doing this. Buying back those that the Jews have been selling. We're buying them back. What does this mean? Reminder of God's purpose. At the heart of the gospel, at the very center of our faith, is this idea of buying back. God has purchased us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Jesus says, I came to give my life as a ransom to pay to buy back many. Colossians 1.14, God has purchased your freedom. Isaiah 43, I have redeemed you out of darkness. Bought back, same Hebrew word, same concept. At the very center of the gospel of what we believe here as Christ followers is the fact that God has bought us back out of darkness, out of sin, out of death. He's purchased our lives, now we belong to him. We were once slaves to sin and death, even though we didn't even know it. God bought us by the death of his son, he paid for our ransom. That's at the, he's reminding them about God's redemptive purpose. Now of course, Nehemiah was, would be seeing through a glass darkly looking forward, he doesn't know about Christ's ultimate redemption yet, but he does know, even then, this is at the heart of who God is to buy back the lost, to ransom the captive, to purchase the slaves. He's saying to them essentially, God purchased you by his grace. How dare you sell each other or buy? How can you do that? The Jews, the Israelites, were called to be a witness, an example, a light to the world around them. Isaiah 49, verse 6. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That phrase, make you as a light to the nations, was the center of Jewish identity, Israelite identity. We are God's chosen people, not because we're special, because he is. He's chosen us to be a light to the world. How are they going to be that light? And that's the same purpose for the church, by the way. Jesus said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, right? You don't light a lamp light, and put it under a bowl. Let your light shine. God's people are to be a light to the world. How do we do that? First and foremost, by the way, we treat each other. We talk a lot about serving the world here. That's a good thing, a God-honoring thing, and we're very excited about it. But not at the expense. But what good is it to build a wall around the people who are bitter, deceptive, vindictive, manipulative, and exploitative? 
Why build a wall around people who are living that way? What good is the wall if that's what's happening? The wall is to bring identity to God's people as a light to the nations so that his salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That's the whole point. And that brings us to the next appeal, a passion for God's reputation. A passion for God's reputation. The second half of verse 9, he says, so the taunts of our enemies will stop. What's he mean there? Not that the enemies are mocking them, but they're mocking their God. Your God's not strong. Your God can't do this. Your God can't save you. Nehemiah is not so much concerned with his reputation, but with God's. And he sees what many of us miss, that when we mistreat each other, when we divide and fight, or are just cold and distant from each other, we are damaging not just each other, but the reputation of God in the world. We don't have to look hard to find examples of this, do we? Churches fighting and splitting over petty things because of sin. Pastors cheating and lying. Christians suing each other, acting no different than anyone else in the world. The end result is not just damage to those people directly involved, but damage to the reputation of Christ in the world. We see that in our culture. Now, I know that there's a lot in our culture that's hostile to the gospel and set against God, but we have to own some of it. We in the church have to own some of it. That by the way, we have fought and mistreated one another. We've given reason for people to say, well, that's what Christianity is. I'm not sure I want to be in. I'm not sure I want that. There is a direct correlation between the effectiveness of our mission and the way we treat each other. There is also a direct correlation between the reputation of our God and the world and how we treat each other. How people think about God is impacted by how you love your brother or your sister. Not just by the fact that you can spit back Bible verses to them. Finally, this last appeal, the power of personal example. Nehemiah was a man led by example. Let's read verses, uh, the rest of the passage here. Verse 14, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 30, 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense each for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people." Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. This is an astounding passage. It, it, now, you might have to get past the fact that it sounds like Nehemiah's bragging. Look what I did, look what I did. He's, he's giving them an example. Remind, they, they have, he's like Paul saying, you know how I was when I was with you the whole time, how I was not a burden to you. He's saying to them, I don't have to tell you about this. You know how I was, but let me remind you because what you've been doing is exactly the opposite. It's really an interesting thing here. He showed them in his own life. This is a crucial leadership principle. It's also a crucial spiritual principle for every Christ follower. John 13, Jesus says, I have set for you an example that you should do for each other as I have done for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. People are listening to your life as much or more than your words. In verses 14 and 15, he refers to the, the former governors. He says, I didn't take the food allotment that was allowed to me. He's not saying I didn't, uh, he's saying I didn't even take what was legally mine to take, would have been mine by right. At the expense of the people, right? This is exactly, if you remember back to our series at the end of the spring, the paradox of spiritual growing smaller, the paradox of spiritual greatness, Jesus says, you know how it is among the leaders of the Gentiles, how they lowered it over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must become your servant. That's what Nehemiah is living out right here. He's saying, you know, you know how it was. You know how it is in the world. The world's leaders work on this principle, your life for mine. 
Your life to make my life more comfortable. Your taxes, your vote, your service makes my position possible. Nehemiah and, and our in Christ say, no. My life for all of yours. At my expense, at my discomfort, my sacrifice to bless you. That's the way he's living. He really is a picture of Christ in that way. In other words, because Nehemiah loved God, he loved and served God's people. Notice he says, uh, he says, but I did not do it out of the fear of God. I did not do it, take what was mine, the tax that was due me or the food allotment due me. And even I went above and beyond and paid for all that in my own pocket. Why? Out of the fear of God. What does he, that phrase comes up all the time in the Old Testament, the fear of God. What does he mean? In case you've ever wondered about this, it's not, the fear of God in the Old Testament is not being afraid of God. It does not mean walking around a fear of God zapping you if you step out of line. I think the best way I could describe it is this. To live with the fear of God is to live with God in view all the time. Is to live with God at the forefront of your mind for every decision, every action, every word, to think about an eternal perspective, to live with God in view. Most of us, myself included, don't live that way, do we? We live with God sort of in the rearview mirror, right? Or God somewhere in the background. We have our, other, our family, our, our careers, our friends, our own interests, that's in view. God comes into view occasionally. I think to live with the fear of God is to live with God always in view. To see your life, your relationships, your decisions, your finances, your future, through, God, through, through God's eyes, through a lens that has God all over it. Nehemiah says, I didn't do this because I had God in view. Not my own comfort, not my own security, because I was seeing it the way God saw it. That whatever sacrifice I make now, I get back a thousandfold. Which is why Nehemiah says, this prayer at first bothered me. He says, so remember me for my good, O God. Like he says, remember God, get, 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 you know, I, wanna, I want a little credit for this someday. I sort of thought, that sort of ruins it, doesn't it, if you ask for credit? But I think it's exactly right. Nehemiah is not asking for credit. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, when you give your, uh, to the poor, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but do it in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's the part we forget. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I wonder, this is, it may have been Nehemiah's journal. I wonder if Nehemiah even knew it was ever going to be published. I'm eternally grateful it was. It is, aren't you? I wonder if Nehemiah, this is part of his prayer where he said, God, remember this for my good. Remember the sacrifices. I don't want credit from them. But I want to be good in your eyes. I want to be honorable in your eyes. I want the God who sees what's done in secret to reward me. Eternally speaking, I'm not looking for earthly kickbacks or reputation. I have God in view. For us, Nehemiah says, I did not do so out of the fear of God. How would we put it? What is the fear of God in our day? I would put it this way, and I think they're almost synonymous. For I did not live that way, what is, whatever way that is. I did not operate according to the principles of this world. Why? Because of the love of Jesus. I think you can almost substitute those phrases, the fear of God and the love of Christ. And they go right together. The love of Christ always in view. The love of Christ is my significance so I don't have to extract it from some other person. The love of Christ is my security so I don't have to try to build it in my bank account. The love of Christ is my reward so I don't have to seek it on earth. I did not live that way, whatever that way is. Why? Because of the love of Christ in my heart. I think that's what, essentially what Nehemiah is saying here. I did not do it out of the fear of God. For us today in the church, to be countercultural, different, because of the love of Christ. If you leave here with anything tonight before we pray, I want you to leave with this. Foundationally speaking, the best thing we can do to make Christ known in the world, not the only thing, but the very best foundational thing we can do is to love each other, is to treat the family of God with dignity, respect, sacrifice and love. Not to come here and be polite, oh, how you doing, and, and walk away and forget about each other, but for people on the outside to see that's a family. They love each other. That, more than anything, I think has power to change the world. Let's pray. God, we thank and we praise you for your grace made known to us through Jesus Christ, for this ancient text which speaks so powerfully to our context today. 
We thank you for the example of Nehemiah, which points us to your example, Jesus, that you gave up your life for us. You don't demand our life for yours. You give yours for our sake. Help us, Lord, inside our family, your family, to love each other, that you would be known and your salvation would be known in the earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.